Thank you so much for having me and welcome everybody. Um, so we're going to have a couple sections in this class today. First, I'm going to tell you um, a little bit more and show you some examples of my work. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about scribal arts and so fruit in general. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. Um, and then we're going to move on to a practical section where I'm going to show you some of the materials that we're going to be working with. And I'm going to show you the basics of how they work. Um, and hopefully by the end, you'll have, you'll be well on your way to making a little piece. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, at the end of each section or periodically, I'm going to answer questions. So if I'm not, if I'm not hearing you, don't worry. I haven't, you haven't been forgotten. So as Julie said, um, I, I'm an artist. I do, my practice is mostly about book art. So that means letters, shapes of letters, books, different kinds of books, scrolls, different materials. So I'm, I'm very interested in parchment and working in parchment in different ways and that. So, so fruit and calligraphy, a lot of it is done on parchment. Um, but I also do binding with parchment. Parchment is a very old um, material in bookbinding as well. So this is one little example I want to show you. This is a sidor that I bound um, that is bound with a, um, it's a land deed that was written on parchment that I then repurposed and um, in the Hebrew letters of the Psalms because it's a Friday night, um, it's a Friday night book. Parchment has a lot of uses and there's a lot of different sort of like parts of my practice um, and my work. So that's just one of them. So yeah, if you have any questions or about that, you can see also see more examples of my work on my website, which is beanadesign.com, which I'll put in the chat at the end. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about me. So, so fruit, oh, one thing to say, so you should all have this booklet um, that you received and I'm going to, I'm going to refer to things in this um, and I will show you along the way, um, but feel free to use this as a resource throughout this hour and afterwards. So, so fruit means scribal arts or calligraphy and um, someone who practices sofrut is a sofer or a soferet. Sofer is masculine, sofer is feminine. Um, you can see on page two this terminology. And sofrut, sofrut usually um, involves three main texts. And this is called sofrut stam. Stam is an acronym that stands for Sefer Torah, a Torah scroll, Tfilin, to fill in the phylacteries, and Mezuzah, um, the Mezuzah that we put on our doors. And there's one sort of younger sibling of all these, that's the Megillah, which is the Megillah Esther, the Book of Esther, which is read on Purim in the early spring. So these are the main texts that are written, that Hebrew calligraphy, ritual calligraphy focuses on. And um, because I belong to a modern Orthodox community where women and men have different roles and women don't traditionally do, this, do all the mitzvot that men do, I personally only write Megillat Esther. Um, and I do not write Sefer Tarat and Mezuzah, or at least not yet. Um, so, it's an interesting, it's an interesting place to be both ideologically and, um, and sort of practically. So, so fruit has two main areas of knowledge. Um, one are the practical skills of how you do things. And one is the, and the other are the laws around so fruit. So, there are a lot of halachot laws. Here's an example. There are this many. Um, there are lots and lots of rules. 
that govern how you write and what you write with in order to make a scroll kosher and, and ritually usable. Um, so that, so that, and those laws, they just apply to the Torah, Tefillin, Mezuzah, and Megillah. Um, so that is sort of like an overview of what ritual calligraphy entails. Um, but of course, there's lots of different kinds of Hebrew calligraphy and, and calligraphic arts throughout history. And so we're going to be we're going to be leaning into that um, today, and and you'll get a glimpse into what the what the ritual aspects of this are as well. So the um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some examples of different types of scripts, um, and the way people write is kind of like an accent. So just the way different people all over the world speak slightly differently, they speak different languages, but they also, the intonations and the way they speak are different. Um, like people, how people speak English in different ways all over the world. Um, the same thing is true of calligraphy. And there are lots of different styles of Hebrew calligraphy, um, which I will show you. So, um, let me share with you guys. Are there any questions so far? I see there are some questions about the about the booklet. Um, okay, so here we go. Can everyone see this slideshow? Okay, so the first example that we're going to look at is a, a Torah scroll written in Kaifeng in China in the 17th century. And you can see this, this script is very angular. Um, it's very pretty. This is a section from Breshit, the Genesis in the first book. This is an example and you can see it looks quite different. It's much more rounded, it's denser. Um, this is a Hebrew script from Spain, the 15th century. Um, it, is a, it is a classic Sephardi script. This is a German Torah. Um, again, this is sort of um, a classic medieval Ashkenazi script. And this is an example of a um, this is actually the book of Esther, Megillat Esther. And it is a fairly standard Ashkenazi script as well. Um, so those are some examples. I, I'm just going to go th go back through those so you can see how different those scripts look. Does that make sense? So this last one is closest to the script that we're going to discuss in a moment that we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on the Beit Yosef, which is script, which is a classic Ashkenazi standard script at the moment. Now, we're not quite going to be writing Torahs or Megillah, but what we are going to be doing is we're going to be looking at a tradition of, of art that decorates the Eastern wall to denote which direction Jerusalem faces and therefore which direction we pray in. So here is an example. So the word Mizrach, which you can see at the top there, um, means east. And this is one example. These are often decorated synagogues or homes. This one's from 1926. I believe this is an ink drawing. This is a very different looking Mizrach um, piece um, with lots of images from Israel. But it says, again, says Mizrach right at the top and it's sort of stylized to look like stained glass. This is, it's a bit of an older looking Mizrach as well. 
and um, sort of very classic. You can see this kind of work in a lot of synagogues. And here is one last one. You can see Mizrach is sort of in the middle of the circle in the upper third. And this is a little piece that I made <laughs> a couple of years ago. So um, that is just an example of some of my work. Um, but I, I, um, I really like working on Judaica for, for your home and things that can make a home feel special and meaningful and Jewish. And so this is one sort of piece that we can do um, to further that goal. So that's what we're going to be working on today. Does anyone have any questions about, about that? Thank you, Susan, for correcting me on the pronunciation. I appreciate that. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the Beis script and some of these materials. So the materials that are traditionally used, the first is the writing surface. So in, for the case of in Safrut so Stam, this means parchment. Um, and here's an example of some parchment with some lines which are etched in or scribed in with an awl. And parchment comes from the skin of an animal. animal. Um, now most parchment comes from cows, often fetal cows, um, fetal calves. Um, but in the past, um, well, any, any kosher animal um, is fit for use for parchment um, in these things. And in the past, deer, goats, sheep, even sometimes people say chickens, um, have been used um, to write tefillin, mezuzot, and sefer Torah. For chickens, I assume it has to be tefillin or mezuzah because chickens aren't big enough to write a whole Torah on, unless it was a teeny tiny Torah. Um, but now it's mostly um, cow, and it's, it's always been a byproduct of the meat industry. Um, so now, um, now this parchment either, the skins either come from slaughterhouses or from um, dairy farms that slaughter um, the, the, the milk, the cows once they no longer produce milk. Um, so that, that is what we're right. That is what, that is what STAM is written on. Today we're going to be writing on paper, a little bit easier to work with. Um, but that, but this is what, this is what you expect when you see a Torah. Um, in terms of writing implements, um, most things can be used to write STAM. The two most common ones are reeds like this, um, which are used in um, a lot of Middle Eastern calligraphy, and quills, um, which we will be using today. Um, and they can be from any kosher bird. Um, in this case, these are turkey feathers, and they are the primary pointer feathers on the wing of a turkey. So that means the essentially the biggest feathers that they use to fly. Um, and that means that they don't shed these feathers, I believe. So these are sourced from also a byproduct of the meat industry. Um, and these are carved into quills. So the ones that you have, um, I carved for you. Um, with a scalpel and a, I also use a woodworking knife to do that. So that is the writing implement. And the ink that we're going to be using today is the same ink that, that people write Torahs with. This is, this is a bottle of ink. Um, the word for ink in Hebrew is dio, which just means ink. Um, and it comes in different viscosities. And the ink is made up of a couple things. The primary, what makes it really black is, I mean, the, like the, the bulk of it is soot. Um, and it also has gallnuts in it, which add 
acidity and iron. Here's an example of a gallnut. Um, so when this is produced essentially as an allergic reaction, sort of like hives, I think, um, by trees when they are stung, there are wasps, particular kinds of wasps that sting trees and lay their eggs in the tree. And then the tree essentially as an allergic reaction produces a gallnut, which is very high in iron. Um, so these are ground up and made into, into the ink. And if you, if you ever are going for a hike, um, they're very common. So just look around and you can often find them. Um, and then gum arabic, which um, is the resin, is used to bind it all together and make it less, less watery and a thicker, a thicker ink. Um, so those are the basic materials. I see there's a question, why aren't metal quill tips used? So metal quill tips are used. Um, I think a lot of people prefer the traditional feather, but it's not it doesn't make it pasul or ritually unusable um, to, to use metal. And in fact, in my practice, I use, I frequently use metal nibs, um, both for art and sometimes when I'm doing larger letters as well. Um, so, but Hebrew calligraphy, if you're looking to get, if you're looking to use metal calligraphy nibs, the angle's a little different, um, so. That's something to look out for. Um, does parchment, does the ink bleed on parchment? So that's a great question. It really depends on the parchment and how the parchment is processed. Um, there are some kinds of parchment. Um, I wrote in Megillah that the client wanted written on cloth pots, which is, it feels more like suede than like parchment. Um, and it bled everywhere. It was so fuzzy in the most challenging way possible. Um, and so sometimes it does, and people can use gum sandrac, which is a powder um, that you can apply to try and make it not bleed. But for the most part, on this kind of parchment, um, the ink does not bleed. And the paper that I've given you guys, the cream colored paper, is calligraphy paper. Um, which is a little bit different from normal printer paper, and it, it bleeds less than printer paper. Um, I think there is a sizing in the paper which prevents the ink from being absorbed and running through. So um, the difference between a right and a left-handed quill is the angle at which the tip is cut. And I will show you guys, um, I will show you guys in a moment what that means, but um, in order to be able to hold the, the quill at an angle to the paper, um, you need to have it cut in a, in a different way. So, okay, before we move on to some practical things, are there any other questions? Great, okay. So today, what we're going to be focusing on is we're going to be focusing on the Beit Yosef script. Um, this is based on the writings of the Beit Yosef, Yosef Caro, who lived in the 16th century in Spain. And um, did he described in, at length what he thought each letter should look like in order to be kosher, to be ritually accept acceptable. And um, that has sort of been the basis for a lot of standard Ashkenazi um, Torah writing since then. Um, so, and there are some, there are a couple, there are a couple key components to, to the Beit Yosef script. So first of all, one thing that um, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do together, but I think is might be helpful this page in the booklet. Um, it has all the components. Essentially, the alphabet is modular. So there are lots of different little shapes that put together in different combinations form all the letters in the alphabet. The letter components on this page, um, if you flip them and turn them and combine them, you can make the letters. And what, that's one of the keys to consistent writing. 
sort of like one of the one of the ways that you can tell something is written by a person and not done by a computer is the slight variations in in the writing but really good writing um, that's done by hand has a lot of consistency and part of getting that consistency is having the different components look identical in different letters does that sort of make sense so like um because then you have like a consistent almost vocabulary throughout the alphabet so that's something that might be worth thinking about um in this work something that i'm always thinking about is the and honestly in all the work that i do is the um is the tension between uh, mechanization and things that are handmade. So um, one of my bookbinding teachers would say that people's conception of what a straight line is has totally changed over the last hundred years. And that's something that's really important to remember going forward. So now, because so many of the things that we own and are surrounded by are made by machines and the machines can make perfectly, perfectly straight lines, something that wavers slightly looks off to us. But 200 years ago, when everything was made by hand, people's conception of perfection was just really different. Um, I was working with a Torah this week and the, the, the sheets of the, of the parchment of the cloth were, you could see it was cut by hand, like without a ruler. Um, and that was a pre pre Holocaust Torah and it was it was really beautiful. Um, and I think that we can There's sort of the desire to make our handwork look really perfect as if it was done by machine, but also I think it's important to celebrate the handmade nature of this kind of work, um, because um, by the fact by just by the nature of it being by being made by a human, it's not going to look like it's made by a machine. And there's something really beautiful in that. Um, sorry for that digression. So one of the one of the features of the Beit Yosef script, if you look on page six, here we go, at this page um, in the booklet, is that most of the letters are fit in a three by three grid where the stroke thickness is one third of the overall height and one third of the overall width. So if you look, for example, at bet, the second letter here, you can see that the first stroke takes up one third of the overall height, then you have one third gap in the middle and one third of the stroke on the bottom. So as you're doing this, keep, keep that in mind um, and, and check and make sure that you're keeping those proportions. Now, let's talk a little bit about how to use a quill. Um, let's flip to page seven, this page. There are, quills work really differently than ballpoint pens. So a ballpoint pen, it can be held in any direction and you can move it and write in any direction and the result is the same, right? The line still looks exactly, exactly the same. A quill is not exactly like that. Um, a quill has essentially directionality to it. So, um, there are three types of strokes, essentially. One which is used by, and I'll show you guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a demo so you guys will see exactly what I'm talking about. But you always wanna pull a quill towards you. So you want the sort of the spine, the outer spine, um, which ends in the nib to be up, like in this position. And you always wanna pull it like this and never push it like that. Does that make sense? So, so the first type of stroke is a thick stroke used by pulling 
the quill. Now, I highly recommend that you try this if you want to get out your quill and your ink. Um, I will warn you, this ink does stain. So try to be careful. It's, a, it's difficult to get out of clothing and other surfaces and stuff. Um, so if you have newspaper or something that you can put down, um, paper towels at the ready, that will definitely help. So let me, I'm going to switch and I'm going to show you Um, so you can practice, you can practice on the booklet, you can practice on scrap paper, or you can practice on the calligraphy paper. Um, and what I've done is I've given, there are two, um, there are two kinds of, there are two kinds, there should be two kinds of paper. One is transparent and one is cream colored. Um, the 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 cream colored one is one which you can um, you can sort of freehand if you're feeling bold. The transparent one, if you want, you can put over the booklet like this and you can trace through. Um, so you can practice this with the quill. You can also practice this um, with the calligraphy marker. My apologies, I believe um, I, I was packing all the orders really, really quickly. And so I do hope that everybody got all the things. If you didn't, you can send me an email. My sincerest apologies for that. Um, there is no graph paper, um, but you should have all these things. Um, so this, this calligraphy marker essentially this end with the chisel tip, it sort of mix up, sorry, it, it um, mimics the quill. It does write in every direction. You don't need to dip it in ink, but it'll, it'll mimic the same kinds of strokes that you are doing. So with that, I'm going to change over my camera. And I will show you, there's my arm. Okay, so here we have some paper. So the first type of stroke that we have is the thick stroke. I'm gonna demonstrate this with the calligraphy marker and the quill. So, with the calligraphy marker, I'm just gonna make the, use the thickest part to make a thick line. And with the quill, it's the same thing, just like that, to make a thick line. Obviously the quill is, um, the quill is much thinner just by nature of being smaller, um, but it still has a thick and thin lines. Now, the second kind of stroke is a thin line. Now, this is holding the, the marker or quill in the same exact position, but instead of pulling it like this, we're gonna do a, keep it in the same position and move it vertically like that. I'm gonna show you, I'm, I'm re-dipping my quill. Here is the thick line, and here is the thin line. So that is, those are the first two kinds of strokes. And now the last, the last kind of stroke is essentially, there are some shapes that you can make doing a combination of the two, but there are some shapes that can't be made they're either too fine or, or they, are, they don't fit a combination of those strokes. And those, will you turn the quill and use, use, the, use the tip essentially to draw and guide the ink. 
So I'll show you guys more of this as we go on. Um, this kind of stroke is primarily used to form um, tagim. And the tagim are the little crowns which are on top of the letters. Um, so if you look at page eight with the word Mizrach, which means east, these three little guys are the tagim. So those are formed by either turning or you can also angle up. So you're just using the, the tip like that. Does that make sense? Um, so is there supposed to be a small crack in the nib? Yes, there is. So in order for, if you had, if you didn't have a crack, then you'd be just using the ink, which is just on the very tip of the quill. And by having a crack or a slit down the quill, it allows ink to flow from the upper part down onto your paper or your parchment um, and allows you to go longer between dipping your quill. Um, if it's splitting, then it, you might be pressing too hard. Um, I recommend if you're having difficulty with the quill, I would recommend, first of all, using different angles. So you can do it like this or like this, more vertical or more horizontal, um, and see what is most comfortable and gets a better result for you. And you don't really need to push very hard at all. Just a little, little bit like this. You're just, you're just guiding the, the ink over the surface of the paper. Um, when you're done using the quill or you want to take a break, the ink does dry. Um, it takes a little while. Um, I recommend using, leaving it out for about an hour just to be safe. Um, but what I usually do is either I take a paper towel or a very dirty rag and you can wipe it off. You can also use a Q-tip, a little bit of water, um, but that's usually how I do that. Um, so um, those are the basics of the types of strokes. How long does, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you guys, I'm gonna do a demonstration of these words, both with the calligraphy marker and the quill in a moment. So you'll see. So um, the, the, the quill, it can last for quite a long time, but it does wear down. Um, I think, I believe that it's a similar material to your fingernails. Um, and so it gets brittle and it also essentially from sort of rubbing it against the parchment or the paper, it, it gets it gets dull and doesn't have as crisp and sharp an end. Um, and so you need to sharpen it ever so often. Um, and this I do with a scalpel, usually by thinning the edge and just cutting a tiny, tiny bit off the end. But that said, it does last a little while. Um, and you can tell once, once your, the sort of edges and contours of your strokes are no longer crisp that it might be time to sharpen it or, or eventually get a new quill. Once, once you get into the sort of white part here um, from the translucent part, the white part is much more fibrous and doesn't work as well. Um, and so that means it's time to get rid of the quill and use and get a new one. Um, so one thing that is kind of interesting about this type of calligraphy. For so fruit stam, only black ink is permissible. So that's why this ink is always black. And it's very neat. When it dries, it has this like shiny, sort of glossy effect, where if you look at it sort of in raking light, it, it can be, it can sort of flip and look almost white. Uh, that said, there are lots of different types Lots of different colors 
of inks out there, like these. Um, there, I have many more, but these are just a sample. Um, these are acrylic inks that I like to use. Um, I would be wary about using them with quills. Um, I think they would probably stain the quill, but you could definitely try. Um, I usually, for art pieces, use acrylic ink with um, dip pens or metal nibs. So now what we're going to do um, is I'm going to show you, I'm going to demonstrate writing these letters. Um, and one thing, one thing to note, um, so, um, oh, the, the brand of acrylic ink that I like most are the FW inks, um, but there are lots of brands of, of artist inks that are all great. Um, one thing that is that to remember, because the overall proportions, because it's the height is one third of the thickness, the size of the letter is proportional to the size of the nib. So for a quill, which is narrower, um, that means it's gonna, the, in order to get the right proportions, you're gonna have smaller letters. And these letters should be about the right size for, for copying with the quill. And then for the larger, for the larger letters here, they're the correct size for the calligraphy marker. Um, so if you want to copy it, either if you want to copy it through the transparency, the transparent paper, um, keep that in mind. Um, so the brand of black ink that I have, um, this is Dio Neharai, and this is brought, bought from a Sofruit specific supplier. Um, I buy all my stuff from Merkaz Has Sofrim, um, which I will put in, in the chat. Um, and they sell, they sell a lot of different Sofruit things out of Brooklyn. Now, um, I'm first going to start by showing this with the calligraphy marker, just because it'll be, it'll be a bit bigger and easier for you to see. Um, also note that the calligraphy marker has two sides. Um, I'm going to use mostly the broad side, but if you want to use the other side for decorations, then that can be pretty helpful too. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to copy this text, the Mizrach. So note, I'm not starting in the middle because if I want it, it's going to be hopefully vaguely centered. So I need to start slightly to the right of the center. Um, so the Mem, I'm going to start by forming like this. It's important to note that there are lots of different ways of forming letters. And as long as you're consistent, that's really what matters. So I'm turning it, shape the mem a little bit. Here's a zine, second letter. And I'm going to turn the calligraphy marker in order to make the tagim, the crowns. I like to do the center one first to make sure that they're all going to be centered on the letter. The tagim are not what's called me'akev, which is a Hebrew word for saying that they do not themselves determine the kashrut, the um, whether whether something can be ritually used or not. So you obviously don't need to have them. Uh, I mean, you don't need to do anything right now. You can do whatever you want. But even in a Torah, you don't need to have tagim. Um, and, um, and that also means that you can do, you can, there's, there's room for 
artistic expression there. Um, and now I'm going to do a rage. Like that. And lastly, I'm going to do a cut, which is very similar to a zayin. It's two, essentially two zayins put together. Like that, and then combined with a little, what's called a hump or point. And there, oops, sorry, it's a little crooked. Um, there we have it. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure exactly which looks like a vav. This this is simil, is very similar to a vav. It's part of the mem. The mem has two components. Um, the mem is essentially made up of a kaf, this, this shape, and a vav, which are then connected. Um, the vav is a little different because it's a little bit slanty in a way that a standard vav is a little bit straighter. So that is with the calligraphy marker. And now, oh, you can see straight through that. Now I'm going to show you with, let me adjust this. Here we go. Hopefully this way, you'll be able to see exactly what I'm doing. Um, I'm, I will, Julia, I'm happy to, um, I'm going to do this again in the quill and then I'm happy to do it again in the calligraphy marker. So it's important to note this is hard and this is complicated and it takes patience and practice. So if, if this isn't looking exactly the way you want it to, that's totally fine. Um, and just give it, give it some time. Um, and keep practicing. So this is a little bit smaller, but I'm going to start by doing the mem like this. And I'm going to connect that kaf and that va. Now I'm going to do a zayin. I don't know how much running out of ink a little, so I'm going to dip my quill again. There we go, there's that. Here's a rish. And cut. I'm going to add those little crowns onto the zine. And there we have that is that is that. So now I'm going to go back to the calligraphy paper so that you guys can see a little bit better. And I'm going to do this again. So you can see. I think one, um, I think that a, one of the keys to getting consistent lettering um, is just practicing the same letter again and again and again. Um, so we're not doing that today because the goal is just to try this out and see, and see how it feels. Um, but I highly recommend that if you want to keep working on this after the workshop. So again, for the mem, I'm going to start with the cuff like this, and see it's one third, and the center is a is a stroke thickness, and then the bottom is a stroke thickness. And 
And there we have oops, like that. connect the lamp. Going to make the sign this. And I'm going to add the tagim here. Now I'm going to do the rish. And lastly, I'm going to put the chet, which is also like two signs put together. Like that. Now, um, one thing that First of all, if you're having issues with the marker bleeding, um, one thing that might be helpful, I know this is difficult when you're just practicing, but the f if, you, if you keep moving a little bit faster, then you're putting down less ink and it'll bleed, it'll bleed less. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, is this all upside down for you guys? It's showing upside down. Oh no! Oh my god! I'm so sorry. Oh yay! I wish, I wish I had realized that earlier. I'm so sorry everybody. That's a problem. Okay. So that, that should look more like Hebrew. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna how's this? I'm gonna do I'm gonna do this again and I will particularly go slowly on those zions for you guys. So I'm gonna do it's a good thing that we essentially have three zions in this word. Because we have a sign and two huts. So here we have a mem. There are lots of different ways to do a sign. This is just how I tend to do them, but I'm holding it at a slight angle. So instead of straight up and down, I'm holding it at a slight angle. I'm just kind of pulling it in a slight line, that curve that way and that way. Here's a rash. And here. There is a hut. Um, great. So that, that is the lettering. Obviously, however feels best is the right way to do it. Um, and you can totally decorate this however you want. Um, one thing that I thought might be helpful is that there are a bunch of patterns here that you can either, there's a little skyline of Jerusalem, a la some of the traditional Mizrach signs. Um, and if you're using the transparency paper, the transparent paper, one thing you can do is you can just put it over and either with the quill and the ink or with the calligraphy marker, both on the thick side or the fine side, what you can do is you can just trace over it. So if I want this, if I want this pomegranate, I can just trace it just like that. And there I have a little pomegranate under my Mizrach. So are there any other um, 
Are there any other questions I'm gonna that people have? Um, obviously, this is just the beginning, and there there is always more to learn, um, and it takes years of practice to be. Um, if you want your writing to look as beautiful as Julie's, then it takes many, many years of practice. Um, and um, there are also um, a bunch of people who teach. I teach group classes. I also teach private, um, private lessons. Um, there are lots and lots of videos online. Um, there are a couple on my site. There are lots on YouTube if you want to look for more stuff. Um, and yeah, it takes, it takes a long time, but I hope that you guys got a little taste for how, how this works and the background of this type of calligraphy. Um, and yeah, does anyone want to show, um, a letter or a doodle or something that they've, that they've made? Oh, nice. Ann Ellen, Hannah, that looks great. Puck, that looks awesome. Janice, Judith, Saren, Gail, Hadi, Lila, Heidi, this looks fantastic. So exciting. Amy, this looks great. And if you don't have something that you're feeling proud of at the moment, that's okay because this is just the beginning. Um, does anyone have any other questions or something that I can help them with? We have a couple more minutes left. There were a few questions in the chat. Great. Um, one was about being left-handed. Mm -hmm. So thank you. So I will admit that I do not have a lot of experience writing left-handed because I'm a righty. Um, people who are right or left-handed, anyone can write a Torah. Um, if you do have a dominant hand, then you have to write with the dominant hand in order for it to be considered kosher. And if you're ambidextrous, um, I believe they, the rabbis prefer that you write with your right hand in order for it to be kosher. Um, but that said, you can also do whatever you want. Um, and in, in order for the ink not to smudge, in order to pull the ink, um, the letters, you do write the letters the opposite direction from, from right to left. Each stroke goes right to left as opposed to left to right. And I will say that, um, that, that um, lefties do have a leg up, so to speak, in Hebrew calligraphy because Hebrew is written right to left and so your hand would not be in the way um, whereas for righties your hand is in the way um, and so one of the critical things for learning how to write this kind of um, write Hebrew calligraphy which with ink that does not dry instantaneously is to hold your hand so that the sort of the ball of your hand is below the line. Um, this works also if you're writing in pencil and don't want graphite on the side of your hand as well. Um, so that you're essentially angling your hand so that your hand is not touching what you've already written. So. Great. Yeah. And some people are asking about the booklet and the kits. Are those still available for purchase on your on your website? So I am going to essentially, this booklet was intended to go along with this workshop, which is why it doesn't have a tremendous amount of explanation in the booklet. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to redo the, like I'm adding an explanation to the booklet and then I'm going to be selling a kit um, with all the basic things and the booklet. Um, so if you're if you're interested in in purchasing that um, but if today 
you, if you attended today and you would like to print out the booklet, um, you can email me and I can send you something that you can print on a home printer um, so that you can have so you can have these resources immediately or as close to as possible. Great, thank you so much. Of course. Um, would you be able to, is your email on your website, Rachel? Yes, so the best way to contact me is through the contact page on my website. Um, and there, I've just put my website again. Oh, oops. Um, which you can, oh, Julie just posted it. Um, and you can, you can contact me there um, and I'm happy to help in whatever way I can. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And one last question. What, do you have a favorite letter to write? Oh, so tricky, so tricky. Um, I quite like Lamed's. Um, I like the, Lamed has a, I almost want to say a tail. I sometimes think it looks a little bit like a giraffe, um, which I can show you with its head sticking out. Here's a, here's a little doodle of a Lamed and a giraffe. Um, so yeah, that's my favorite letter. What about you, Julie? Oh, <laughs> um, my favorite letter is mm, Samech. Really? Why? It's just round and kind of clean. Nice. <laughs> um, awesome. Yeah. Also, one last thing I forgot to mention is that if you feel like your calligraphy needed a little bit of bedazzling, I'm here for you. So if you want to use these little jewels for the tagim, or you just want to use them to decorate, or you feel like putting them on other stuff, enjoy them. Gotta keep, gotta keep it light.